through the other one if you want to. Um, how are we doing on the sort of U-shaped one? Is that still confusing? Is that one understandable? <laughs> What I got is that uh, there's a lot of holes in this understanding. But what I got is that basically what we want to know how each uh, variable, let's say each x, x1, x2 contributed to y, the more we want to know about each one, that's when it gets um, more complicated. Right. Okay, and then that's the threshold. <laughs> okay, well that's that's a good start. Okay, so we're looking at the situation where we're looking at we're manipulating the relationship between two predictors and one outcome. It's much more complicated when you have five predictors and one outcome, but we're not going to, you can't do that in a Venn diagram very well. Uh, but the principles hold, and you'll see how it works in terms of real output. <clears throat> so, under the uh, circumstances, the first circumstance is complete independence, right? So that would be the one where that's y, that's x1, that's x2. This is a real easy one. Remember, we're, the tricky thing about this is we're just taking a specific example of y1 and y2 being ry1 equals 0.5, ry2 equals 0.3. That's just one out of a million possible scenarios, but we're just taking one scenario. In this scenario, the first predictor correlates about 25%, second about 9%. And if we put a, the R squared for that one's easy, it's just 25% plus 9% per square, 36% of the variance of common core and Y. Simple because there's no overlap at all. And that was the one where <coughs> 36% on the dipped U shape one. What happens in that situation to the two predictors? That's what this one shows. The top line is, is the first predictor, y1. The second one is y2. Well, that's also quite simple in this configuration because basically <coughs> the y1 is at 0 here, is 0.5, or 25%, would be the squared semi-partial. And y2 is... Uh, 0.3 or 9%. Right? So <clears throat> it turns out in this in this configuration, in this configuration only, these Pearsons are the same as the beta weights. Beta weights are somewhat similar to actual correlations. They change when we start doing configurations. But so the beta weights in this case would be 0.5 and 0.3, just as they are in the original equation. Nothing really changes with that one. <clears throat> okay. Now we're, for the Venn diagrams, we can only move in this direction. When we go to that direction, we can't do Venn diagrams because in negative space we can't do it. So now we're just moving to the right. So the next one is we start moving towards more overlap between the predictors. Oh, and I, on, your, on your output there, I've given you the first example. It's a little tough to read, but paper up. So case one is R12 is zero. Oops, that's not supposed to be, that's supposed to be uh, complete uh, complete independence, sorry. I, I mistyped that. Sir? The first one, this is partial redundancy. What should it be? Should be independent, total, uh, complete independence. R12 is zero. The equation is y prime equal 0.5x1 plus 0.3x2. The squared semi-partials are 0.25 and 0.09. Everybody with me? That little tiny, tiny first line. Okay, case two is partial redundancy. Where we're going to put in, I just made up one where r12 is 0.5. r12 is 0.5. So, see if I can draw this decently. X1, which is well, it is there. X2 is about like that. So I want this, and it's probably too much, too much here. It should be. 
This should only be 9%. This should be 20, this, this area should be 25%. This area needs to be 9%. So we're emphasizing the overlap between that sort of area. And the overlap, 25%. <clears throat> That's the most common case, and you would, just as you would expect, since they're overlapping, the regression weight, the overall R squared doesn't really change too much. We saw that before. So in our, in our graph from last time, I should put that graph on there too. So is the overlap also considered the squared semi-partial? Um, well, it would be just between those two, but usually you don't use that as a squared semi-partial. Someone got that sheet from last week with the configurations on it? This? Yeah. So, so in this one, I should put this one on here too. <coughs> so in this one, you can see as we go in here, the R squared is going to go down because we're not getting as much punch from each variable since they're overlapping. If we go to point 0.5, the R squared is going to be about 0.25 overall, but it's big R squared. So about 25% of the variance will be accounted for, which makes sense, right? Because in this case, we're not eating up as much of the Y as we did before, less of it's being kind of taken up by the X's. So we're going to get an overall R squared that's lower. And what happens to the two regression weights? Well, this regression weight actually doesn't decline very much in this case. It stays about, uh, about goes down to about 0.4 in this case, I'm guessing, just by the graph. But the lower one drops way down to about 0.1. Right? <clears throat> so you can see there's a complicated interaction between the regression is trying to kind of maximize its usage of the two variables. The one that has the greatest predictor sort of dominates a little bit. <clears throat> the other one, as we get redundancy, sort of takes a back seat and predicts less within that equation. They kind of, they kind of play off against each other with the more the stronger correlations having the more dominant role. And that would be getting us to partial redundancy. We went to Complete redundancy of about 0.7. And that's five, six, six, seven. Here, <clears throat> we still don't lose too much in the first predictor. It's about still about 0.4, about 0.35. <clears throat> but now this predictor drops out completely, right? It actually becomes a little bit negative. So it's hard to see that exactly, but that's something you would you would notice. If you pay attention to your first correlation matrix with the, the straight Pearson correlations to start with, you would want to notice that that second predictor, which correlated 0.3 to start with, moved to a minus when you put it into complete redundancy. That would help you recognize <coughs> that maybe those two predictors are too correlated. 0.7 is probably too correlated to be useful at complete redundancy. You could still leave it in there, but you just need to know that you're not getting much bang for the buck for the second predictor once they're overlapping by 0.7, by about 50%, 49%. <clears throat> okay, then we go to, to more redundancy again, but in this case, I put them in as uh, 0.9, 6, 7, 8, 9. Here we're really getting a very strong correlation. This one would be basically like this. case, this is where we get this strange kind of boost in the R-squared, right? Here, the R-squared goes way up at that point, 0.9 point. So <coughs> this is the strange case where we suppress the unwanted variance in our predictor. 
it's kind of like uh, superpowering this predictor by taking out parts of it that don't work for us. That gives us a big R squared, and then it gives us the regression weights kind of really go bonkers. This regression weight goes way, way up. I think I estimated 0.7 or 8 or something. And this one drops down to a really low negative number. Which is strange, because how could something that correlates 0.3 positively to start with go to being a big, strong negative predictor once it's in the equation with the other one? Right? And that's what you want to watch for. You want to watch for situations where from step to step, when you add a predictor, To a step where you've had a predictor, and again, here again, you need, to, you need to notice that it started off as a positive predictor, but now in this configuration, it suddenly goes to being a really negative predictor. That will only happen when there's suppression. And it's a really good thing for you to know because it might help you explain what's really going on in the phenomenon, how these predictors are working together. You don't recognize, you don't really have to calculate it because the computer does it for you. But if you don't recognize it, you'll make mistakes in your interpretation of how it works. And you might be completely puzzled and say, wait a minute, how could this be? This has always been a positive predictor of depression outcome. How could it suddenly become a negative predictor of depression? And that would be through suppression. It's sacrificing itself for the other variable. It's a suicide variable. Kamikaze variable. Kamikaze. I guess that's better. We should we don't want to go to suicide bombers. <laughs> All right. Now, when we go the bear with me here. How long does this last each time? Oops. It'll last but for some reason I had some issue with okay. So how do I how do I log into the SD so one? Yeah, but get out of uh, their SD lab. The link. Oh there it is. I must add on there while you were going. And then connect. Can I say connect? Yeah, connect. So we need suppression in the literal sense. It's suppressing, but it's suppressing unwanted variants, not wanted variants. So in this case it would be X2? X2 is a suppressor. And where's the unwanted variant? In X1, the, the, the part of X1 that's not in Y. That tiny bit. That, that section there. This tiny bit right there. No, 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 this part. Yeah. So it's suppressing that. Remember, the, the R squared is this area over the white area. Think of it as a ratio. So it is suppressing the one that's irrelevant for X1 over Y. Right. Would you factor in that tiny bit that X2 contributes okay. as well, where it's not overlapping? Say again? Tiny portion where X2 Well, yeah, it also, it, it also contributed. This one I did, a, so it contributes a tiny bit to Y also. So, so isn't that factored into that? Yeah, it factors in. And it just depends on how much of that overlap there is. You could have an, ex an extreme one like this. This could happen. Get y, x1, and x2. Right, it's nothing to do with y. It doesn't right. correlate at all. It just takes out n1 variance from x1. That would raise the r squared because? Because the r squared is this area mm -hmm. over the y. So the number, the number shrank. Like that area. The denominator shrank. Right. Can you make that work? Uh, maybe. maybe we should just go on my laptop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, why why would uh, in this other case here the X2 area be relevant to Y? This one, well, yeah. a little bit of it, a little bit of it. Oh, the other one. Y. This one, no, yeah. this one, this one, this will have been looking like a zero correlation to Y. Uh -huh. to start with, that won't be this configuration. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That so would be Y Y. Our y2 would be zero. 
Because mm -hmm. it's not all. But that's also worth noting. So if you look at your Pearsons, <clears throat> you actually need to say them aloud to yourself. Okay. Uh, so adherence does not correlate, or reliance does not correlate to depression improvement. Looking at my Pearsons, it's, it's, it's near zero. Reliance does not correlate to depression improvement. Well, just say that that was the case. Mm -hmm. So you look at your R, and that, and that would now, this would be R, Y, 2 would be 0. But when you put it in the equation, it makes this one get bigger. Right. That's yeah. right. That's suppression. way to tell is look for the result. Okay. You can't, because every configuration is different. So, I mean, you could have a million different scenarios with different R1s and R2s. So what you just look, what you're, what you're trying to spot is situations where adding another variable changes something in the, in the existing variable. Okay. And it, so the most common thing you'll see is it'll just reduce them. More variables reduce them all get reduced. That's that's partial redundancy. That'll be by far the most common case. But then sometimes you're going to get these unusual cases where you notice that this one was correlated positively, but when I put in another variable with it, it changes to either a negative or to a lower one, or one of them goes to be a much higher one. And if that happens, then you know suppression is happening. And what you want to do is try and figure out where is that coming from. And that's the purpose of setting each of these variables in as a set basis in the different models because you're adding each variety right. at different times. And that, in, because you do it that way, you're able to see when things split. Exactly. You get more information. Right. Right. Just running it all together. Exactly. So, that, so okay. we can hierarchically put them in hierarchically in some logical order by the hypotheses, and that gives you a real good idea of what's going on when you do it that way. Okay. okay. At what point does the pressure take away? from what you're actually trying to show? Um, well, it might kill something you really want to be important, right? So it might, it, you just don't know, it just depends on what's happening in the, in the phenomena. But usually, usually it's worth noting because it might actually tell you something important about what's going on. Okay. That makes sense. It's just like if you had a variable that is not correlated at all with your outcome measure, at what point does that increase your variance enough that you're like, okay, it says it works really well, but it's really not affecting what I have. Yeah, if it doesn't affect the other variable at all, then it's just a loss of degree of freedom. So you're, you're losing that. So at some point, you don't know exactly when it's going to be, but at some point, if it's correlated with, this, with the existing variable that does correlate, it'll start being useful for you. And then you, then you have to think through, why would that be? What is there about this variable that's taking away the unwanted variance in my main predictor? Now, sometimes that might, your main, maybe this will happen in, not in the main predictor, so you might not be too happy about that. So you'll have to kind of, you have to kind of interpret it as it goes. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Lucy? She was asking about the denominator. Yeah, just what was the denominator? It's R squared over? Over the white area, whatever that is, the, the non-overlapping areas in the white. Okay, so that'd be X2 over here? Yeah. But not a complete, well, it's, without this, this area that's not overlapping. This one's unusual, but yeah, so I mean, see so yeah, this one can do. So the R squared would be roughly represented by mm -hmm. this area in black over this area. Not this one. Minus the one that's on the line. 
So is this idea that's giving us a false sense of, okay. of, contri of contribution? Is that the problem? Because high I squared is good, right? We want that. So, yeah. So yeah. when suppression is just giving us a false sense of that something's happening? Well, it just clarifies what's happening. <clears throat> so, you know, something that might seem very puzzling. <coughs> You, might, you may have predicted these two things would both be redundant to some degree, and they'd both be predicting the outcome. And then suddenly you see that this one goes to a negative, and this one gets bigger. That's a signal to you that you better figure out why that suppression is happening. What could, be, what could be the unwanted variance? Now remember the example could be reading ability or speed ability. <coughs> All right, so. It turns out that uh, <clears throat> on the GRE, uh, mathematical analytic part, um, your, your ability to do math problems quickly is somewhat independent of your ability to do them, period. And so is it important to look at the GRE score <clears throat> taking out a speed factor? <clears throat> it might be. Some theoretical mathematicians might be very deliberate in their end and they're doing it, but they might make a tremendous contribution to mathematics, even though they're a bit slow in doing calculations. Usually that's not true, but it could be true. So in choosing your grad students for your math, math grad students, maybe you'd like to take out <coughs> the speed factor, which would greatly boost your prediction of how well they would do in grad school, right? Because of their basic, their GRE score, minus sort of corrected for their speed. Or the pilots, the manual ability corrected for their reading ability. There's examples like that. Okay. Now the other one, <clears throat> we can't do with Venn diagrams going in this direction, but it's easy to spot. So when you look <coughs> at your correlate, when you look at your, your correlation matrix to start with, you see a, I'll put the show. Uh, if you look at your correlation matrix, you look at your correlation matrix and you see that the uh, R1, R2 is a negative number, but that both are still positively correlated with the outcome. Right here, you have to stop looking at Venn diagrams because you'll only be confused. You can't draw a negative relationship. <coughs> so the situation occurs, it only occurs in this situation when the two predictors are negatively correlated, but still each positively correlated with the outcome. Fairly unusual situation. That's the one with the acting ability negatively correlated with legal knowledge, both positively correlated with moot court performance. So what happens if you put them all together? <coughs> you get a very unusual situation <coughs> where both regression weights start going up. They both get boosted, and the R squared goes way up, way beyond what you would get from either of them separately. So here's a case where you can actually get more than 36% of the variance accounted for. Seems impossible. How could you get more than the two separate? <coughs> and the reason that happens is because you're, it's an interaction. <coughs> because you're, you're trying to capitalize on the fact that <coughs> some people are both good at acting and legal knowledge, and some people are both bad at it. And those particular subsets at either end are uniquely <coughs> Are, you, are unique to, this, to the sample. In the middle of the sample, this really wouldn't happen, but for the, when you put everybody in together, you'll get this giant boost way beyond what you could possibly imagine from these seven. And that's either net suppression or complementary. It must not be too common because I have a real hard time thinking of very many examples of the wood court ones. That's the classic one. And I hardly remember seeing it. So yeah, so the, the way that the way it happens, if you want to understand how that could possibly happen, you can understand it by the fact in this study that they found there was was a hundred law students. They found about fifteen of them 
who were really good actors and really smart law knowledge, had a lot of law knowledge. And those guys just absolutely aced the performance. They were the top performers by far, way above everybody else. And then they also found about 12 or something that were really bad at both. They were at the bottom of the class and they were really poor actors. <coughs> They're really going to do bad at moot court performance, right? Not only are they very stiff and unawkward in the courtroom presentation, but they didn't even have the points of law down very well. So they got really low grades, much lower than everybody else. If you think about it, just like any interaction, that really boosts the relationship. Suddenly you get a big boost in the relationship so that those two predictors together really give you quite a bit of power in predicting because of the two ends. Now if you just took the middle, um, the middle half of them and, looked at, and eliminated all the, the, the high highs and low lows, you probably wouldn't get that relationship. You probably wouldn't, wouldn't get much of a negative relationship. And then probably wouldn't really make much difference. The two, the two predictors would just work as they work. This so. something that you usually do? No, no, you wouldn't do it. I'm just saying if you wasn't going. <clears throat> so the thing, the, the take home message here is look at the Pearson correlations, examine them separately, and think okay, boot core performance. So, Law knowledge correlates positively with moot court performance. Acting ability, well, positively, I expected that, but the two are negatively correlated together. So I might want to look closely what's going to happen when I put them in together. And that's really all you can do. You can't draw the, the advantage. And in this case, not only does the R squared go way up, but both regression weights go up, just for the very same reason. They're both contributing a lot. It doesn't do the, the, the kamikaze thing that it does here. Here, they're both contributing because they're both working together for the interaction. So I made up a little example here where you actually can see it happening in SPSS. Actually, I put in a bunch of different uh, variables, and we're only going to use a couple of them. So look at the correlation matrix. Y is the outcome. X1 is predictor 1, X2 is predictor 2. I think we're only going to use those. Let's look at those two. So we can see that X1 correlates highly with Y, 0.712. Oh, well, I think it's X1 and X3. And X3 also correlates with y, 0.22. But x2 and 3, 2 and 3, <coughs> correlate very highly. x3, that's 2, 2, 2, 0, right. So, so x, x3 correlates 0.22 with y, mm -hmm. x1 correlates 0.712 with y, but the two of them are very highly correlated. Which ones are you talking about? X, X, X1 and X3. Oh. Let's see if I did this. That's what I did. No, the first one I did was X1 and X2. So in X1 and X2, X2 doesn't correlate. X2 doesn't correlate with Y. X1 does. Well, X2 and X3 are very highly Very highly correlated. Yes. Yeah. So this, this first case I did, though, I just put it in 1 and 2. Okay, so I put one and two in. First, in the first model, I got 0 0.712, about 51% correlated. And then when I put in X2 as well, then I got almost all, almost all the variance correlated. It went up to very high, very high rate. And you can see that the regression weights in each model, if we go down to the, to the next page, under coefficients, first one you get a, a beta weight or a beta, you know, beta weight of 0.712. Uh, 
uh, or B weight of uh, point 1.043. Now when you go to the second step, that first one goes way up, 0.223, and the second one goes way down, because that, that puts that negative correlation between um, about the X1 and the second step. Yeah, so each, there's, a, there's two steps, and the second step I put an X2. Actually, I think I didn't do the right one here, but it's okay. I do X, X. So this minus 973 on the second step for X2, that is the correlation between the two well, predictors? Or with no, no, that's problem? just I, I ran it in two different steps. First with just X1, and then I put an X2 and X1 in the second step. Mm -hmm. Except I don't think I meant to do this one, because this is the one where <laughs> X2 correlates negatively with 1, and 1 and 2 correlate very highly. So, well, this is suppression, yeah. That's, that's suppression. That's what it is. This is suppression? Yeah, because, so this is the case. Look at, look at, the, first, look at the first correlations again. Right. This is a case where x1 and 2, it, forget about that being a negative correlation, essentially, the figure that's a zero. So y, y1 is 0.72, 7, 7.1. y2 is zero, essentially. Okay. Whatever is negative, you're saying it's zero. If it's negative, you're saying it's zero? Yeah, it's so low that, let's just say, essentially it's zero. So that's the case I was drawing up there before. And then... 1 and 2 are correlated 0.692, mm -hmm. right? So that's the case that I did before, y, oh, okay. x1, and x2. Now there's a lot of correlation. Yeah, so you can see what happens from step 1, where you just put in x1, or you account for uh, about 51% of the variance. So step two, when I add in that other variable, accounts for almost all of it. It's 99.9% yeah. .9 of it. It's kind of an extreme case. But. See that? So that's exactly how it would come out as an output in suppression. You can also see what happened to the regression weights down, down in the coefficients. We started with a one point, uh, let's just, we can use either the betas or the, or the raw regression weight. 1.043 is the raw regression weight. That means a one unit increase in X1 would be equivalent to a 1.043 in Y. Then when we put in X2, that goes to 2.028, it doubles. Right, so now we see a one unit increase in X1 would be a 2.02 increase in y, holding constant x2. x2 becomes even more negative. And if you want to look at it as the betas, you can see the same exact thing. Make sense? Where are you getting the 99 percent that correlates almost 99 percent? Yeah, look at the R squared, the second step. 0.692. R squared, 0.999, yeah. Step two, on the first page. The partial? I'll do, well, you can see it there too, but just look at the model summary on the first page. 0.999. These are kind of contrived examples, so I just they were a little bit extreme. <coughs> but there is an example of suppression, a really strong suppression. Would we consider that complete suppression? Yeah, it's probably complete suppression. You no, probably you would do we go from suppression to complete suppression? It's just arbitrary. Yeah. You would probably never see one like this. So I just had to make up some data real quickly that would do it in this. So that means X2. And X1 together. X2 is just a, is just serving as a suppressor, right? right. So that's the kind of kind of guy. But the, the extreme version of it. So you see, you see that there's a suppressor because it doubled or because it's negative in X2? No, never mind the negative because it's zero. Mm -hmm. So it's because you saw that it doubled from X1 to X2, the two models. Yeah. Okay. okay. <coughs> Next one I did. 
I put in x3 and x4. Okay, x3 and x4. So x3 correlates 0 0.220, x4 0 0.500 with y, but x3 and x4 correlate minus 0.734. Yeah. Look at look at the first correlations. First table of correlations. Everybody see where I'm getting those from? Yeah. Okay, so now we see what happens when we put those two in together. So we go to that model. We see in the first step of the model we account for our squared forty uh First step, we only count for 5% of the variance. Second step, we count for 99.9% .9 of the variance. Again, it's an extreme one. So what is this one? Is this suppression or is this, what configuration is that? No, 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 because remember, they both correlated positively with Y. Which model cell are you looking at, on page two or? Page four. This is the case where both of them correlate positively with Y. They correlate very heavily negatively with each other. Yeah, so complementarity or net suppression, that's called. The more modern usages are calling it net, net suppression rather than complementarity. Either one works. That's the one I just showed you with the, uh, the negative side here, like this one. Right. So, it's because of the so that, and then, as Kate, as Kate said, it's like an interaction of some sort. Some sort of an interaction is occurring there. Right, because they both correlate positively with Y, but they correlate strongly negatively with each other. You put them together, they account for almost all the variance. And that has to happen because the extremes in both cases have to be unusual. Yeah, interaction, complementarity, or net suppression, those are all words for the same thing. Okay. Well, interaction is going to occur in other, another context than this, but they did, the way to think about it is some sort of interaction is occurring. Usually people don't call it, I'm sorry, they don't really call that interaction. Okay. Just that's the concept we're using to explain it. We're going to do interaction separately when we do something. I don't know if I follow that. So we're looking at page four, page five. Page four and five. So first four, look at the yeah. two the two R squares. You see those? 0.22 and 0.99. So right. It looks like 0.9, there's lots of suppression due to the 0.99. Uh, the complementary, yeah. Complementary. And that's suppression, right. Okay. That's so the one where they're so strongly negatively correlated with each other that when you put them in together, they really go, the R squared goes bonkers. Okay. Where are you looking at this? That was bottom of page four. And we're yeah. getting we're getting those values that they're negatively correlated from the original correlation table of page. Exactly, one. exactly. Okay. That's the important point. So the so original the correlation on one, we now look at that R squared. Yes. Yeah. He said we're getting the correlations from the first table on page one. That's yeah. the important part. You always refer back to original correlation matrix. That's how you're going to figure it out. Once you know that, then you can see what happens. And then the other part of it you can do in page five, you can see what happens to the coefficients, right, from step one to step two. So the first x3 goes from a 0.22 to a 1.234, goes up four times, fourfold. Or the, that's the beta, the B weight goes from 0.566 at step one to 3.275 at step two on page five. Yeah. Was way up. What is Our significance is 1,707.5. So, what this means, good. this means that there's an interaction between the two predictors and they both. Well, the they're negatively correlated. The way to, th uh, I, want to I want to be careful about the word interaction because we're going to use it differently. But if it, whatever, whatever you want to call what I'm talking about with the law school, it's kind of an interaction concept, mm -hmm. right? The extremes are drawing them aside. 
I just I, I have a hard time to see that this is a negative correlation. You look at the look at the first table. So Robbie was saying, look at the first table. Look at the correlation between three oh. and four. Oh, okay. It won't show you that unless you ask for it. You can you can ask for correlations again, but it won't show you that. Uh, it does show you though in the zero zero no it doesn't it doesn't show you the relationship. Now here's where you could see it though. Look at the tolerance level. Tolerances are pretty low, right? 0.461 on the very bottom of page five. 0.461. So that means that the relationship between x1 and x2 is 1 minus 0 0.461, about 60 some percent overlapping, which is exactly the r squared between them. not because with x2 not correlating at all it won't really have much effect on it <clears throat> right you need to have some initial positive correlation between x1 and x2 and y so I didn't do that one but I don't think it has much impact when you do it that way Yeah, so let's see, zero. So which one which two do you want to put in together? One a two and two and four? Two and four, yeah. Yeah, so let's see. So two and four would be two would start off being doing nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Four would correlate. And mm -hmm. when you put in them together, um, it would boost it would boost two a little bit probably. Yeah. Probably but this one not maybe not so much. But not that much. Might not be enough to be significant or anything. What would be the case if you do the opposite of net suppression, where you have um, the two variables corresponding negatively with y and then corresponding positively with each other? That should be the same. So yeah. it would be called net suppression? Yeah, I think okay. the same thing would happen. It's a good question. I'm trying to think of an example of how that would happen. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, it just depends on the nature of how you're defining the variables. So the variables are just reversed in order, so they're negatively correlated. It should, should be exactly the same. Okay. I've never seen that, but... Okay. <laughs> okay, are we good with that? <clears throat> okay, let's just deal with a few odd topics before we get into interaction. I'll we'll take a break then. Uh, oops. So then that was the final expression that we got. <clears throat> okay. Uh, collinearity statistics. <clears throat> we talked about those. Remember tolerance is 1 minus the R squared when each predictor is used as a DV with all the predictors regressed upon it. Generally, below 0.1 is regarded as, by everyone as a problem. 0.2 is probably a problem too. In this case, we could see 0.4 was pretty bad. <clears throat> There's another index, a VIF index, which is some, some people use, not, not a lot, which is 1 over tolerance, and it gives you kind of an index. Anything above 10, 1 over tolerance above 10 is considered a bad, bad index of too much multi <clears throat> There's also something, another concept in here called a singular, singular matrix. Need to kind of recognize the concept, maybe. So the way this works is there's matrix algebra that's being used to do the calculations here. It's like a formula, except instead of x being one variable, it's a vector of variables, and y is a vector of variables because there's multiple variables in this. 
And in matrix algebra, you can add matrices and you can, uh, you can multiply them. But when you multiply them <coughs> in a very complicated series of steps you do, you multiply one, one, in, one element times the next element divided by something else. Anyway, when the, very, when the matrices have too much intercorrelation, the program crashes and it gives you a, 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 something saying a singular matrix was encountered. That means that there, there's enough intercorrelation among the variables that it actually can't calculate it. So if you ever get a, a, a message, singular matrix, that means somewhere in there, there's, there's too much correlation. Here's how it happens most commonly. People use a scale like the POMS, the Profile of Mood States, which has seven different scales like depression and vigor and fatigue. But there's also a total mood score that's the, you know, those seven added up, or total mood total mood disturbance, TMD. Well, if you put total mood disturbance in with the seven predictors of the things that added up, guess what? They correlate perfectly. So suddenly the whole thing crashes. People think, why is this crashing? What's going on? That's, you can't do that. You can't put into the same correlation something that's added up to be that correlation. So you get that message of the singular matrix. That'd be the most extreme multicollinear. You certainly want to spot it because it means you're using variables you don't need to. Right? Two things measure the same thing. Why would you put them both in the equation? <coughs> They're not giving you anything. Rule of thumb about 0.7 correlation between two things, you start getting worried. Okay. Another thing that uh, the book covers a little bit that some people use are called structure coefficients. It's a little bit different way of looking at the importance of a variable. It's a correlation between the, the predictor, the independent variable, and the predicted score. It tells you which variables are the biggest con contributors to the regression equation. And you get it by calculating, by dividing the correlation between the variable and y by the multiple r. So if that particular variable was 0.5 correlating with y, and multiple r was 0.7, you, you, you divide by 0.7. That way you're sort of controlling for the overall correlation, seeing how much, how much of the overall correlation does this contribute. <coughs> and some people, some authors like these as a way of looking at how important a variable is in the equation as a stru called structure coefficient. So in case you run across them, we don't use them very often, but some people do. The multiple correlation coefficient, the one that we, you know, like on here, is the one we just looked at next to the r squared. The 0.7, in the first case, the 0.712. Oh, okay. All right, so for that particular one, it, well, let's look at this, the second case. So the structure coefficient for that second case on the first page there would be the correlation between that variable, which was, what was it, starting off, 0.712 divided by, uh, the multiple R here is going to be 0.999. It's a little bit of a funny case, but that would be it. It doesn't, it doesn't give it to you, you have to calculate it by hand. <coughs> so, but it is sometimes referred to, so you need to just know that. I think Connie covered this a little bit, but let's go back over it. There are different types of regression. Um, <clears throat> basically, the biggest distinction is between uh, regression that is used for hypothesis testing and regression that's used for exploration. <clears throat> so we almost always are not going to use an exploration one. So what we usually will use is either simultaneous, which means all the variables are in, or hierarchical, where you put them in in the order that theoretically makes sense. Like I did there, step one, step two, step three, step four. And all you do is just by clicking next on the SPSS and then put the variable in. That makes sense because you're putting in <coughs> variables in an order that is theoretically testable. So, like when we're doing the different steps in SPSS, you said that's hierarchical, right? So, um, have we gone over how to run the other types of regression? No, I'll show you those in a second. Um, 
I kind of know that it's stepwise, you kind of be able to put it somewhere. Leave that aside. So yeah, yeah, but what I'm asking is, do you, can you take off also the hierarchical? If you're adding something, can you decide to take it out? Right yeah, now? sure you can. If, if theoretically you want to do that, you can play with it anyway okay. you want. Yeah, you can remove steps, add steps, anything that makes sense to you, seeing how you want to do it. But you're in control on the order of the variables. That's the big thing. Okay. So those are going to be the ones we would almost always use in clinical psych. There are some other techniques that are used in other fields where theoretical explanations are not so important, but just pure predictions important, like actuarial science. Sometimes in I.O., they don't really care. If you were called in as a consultant and tried to find out how to get make more widgets in a factory, and they didn't care what the reason for it was, they just want to know, give it, let us, we want people who can make many widgets an hour help us predict who they are. It turns out that the uh, size of the refrigerator predicts how many widgets an hour they can make. We don't care about the explanation for that. We just want to be able to make that prediction. Right? So in that case, you would use one of these forward, backward, or stepwise. In those cases, what they do is stepwise says, look through all the variables, take the biggest predictor first, put it in the equation, then go to the next one the next biggest, with that one already in, put that one in, and then go to the next biggest with those two in and put that one in and keep on going until they're no longer significant. So it's purely empirical selection of variables. And very dangerous from a theoretical point of view because what sometimes people do is they'll do stepwise regression and then interpret it theoretically. Right, so this is choosing the winner of the horse race after the race is over, that's not fair. So you don't want to do it. You really can't use stepwise for anything that's theoretical, only for if you want to do something purely actuarial. So insurance companies, and trying to figure out your car insurance rates, plug in a million variables. What's your, what's your zip code crime rate? How far are you from the nearest fire station? Um, how old are you? What's your gender? Blah, blah, blah. So there's a million things. They put them all in and they say, what correlates with claim rates? Whatever they are, that's how they choose to do the rate. That's how you get, that's how you get your insurance rates. Some of them might seem totally stupid to you, but they don't care. If they predict it, they predict it. The width of your driveway turns out to be a good predictor of your claim rate. So but nobody's suggesting that wider driveways cause less accidents. Some relationship somewhere. Yeah, the, yeah. the first hurdle being do you have a driveway? Do you have a driveway? I mean, in one study I remember that was one of the ones. <laughs> so, you know, in personnel selection, it may be something silly like the like your big finger length versus your small finger length makes you make more widgets. That's what predicts it, that's what predicts it. They don't care. <laughs> But we don't want to do that. The only time we would do stepwise is when we're really in the dark about something, completely exploratory. Got a whole bunch of variables, we're going to throw them in, use that as the first step to choose some possible hypothesis, hypothesized things, and then later move on to some theoretical hierarchy. When you do that, you can do it just straight stepwise, or you can do a forward direction, which means that variables go in one at a time, or you can do backwards, where you put them all in and take them out. You get slightly different results when you start from the, all of them, take these out, then we put them in. These are not going to be very important for us, these, these other techniques. Now, it gets to be important, theoretically, if you're not careful. So here's the famous example of this. It came out of the Coleman Report back in the 60s. <clears throat> so they're trying to determine uh, whether or not school busing, this was, came into the argument about school busing in the 60s. They're trying to determine what were the determiners of school performance, school achievement, Philadelphia, actually. And they put a whole bunch of variables in to try to predict school, uh, individual student achievement. And the ones that came out were some variables that had to do with the family demographics and some that had to do with the school demographics. So it turned out that <coughs> The, the two top predictors were one was a school one and one was a family one. And the family one, and they were pretty highly correlated with each other. So the 
family one was it's called a proxy variable because it obviously isn't the thing itself, but it stands for something. It was the number of books in the home. It's very, this couldn't be done anymore because nobody has any books anymore. Right? It's all electronic. But in those days, <clears throat> they did a survey and asked people to estimate how many books they had in the house. And low SES families don't grab many books, obviously, so it, and, and unless they're very highly valued reading. So this was a proxy for sort of educational values of the family. And it turned out to be a pretty good predictor. About 17% of the variance in school achievement was accounted for by number of books in the home. Uh, the, the top school one was a little bit less than that, was 16% was um, uh, per, per pupil spending in the classroom. <coughs> Right. However, when you put them in, the, the two correlated with each other. So this was a case of partial redundancy, right? So if you didn't decide which one to put in first yourself, it changes everything, right? Because you put the first one in, number of books in the home, they chose to be a stepwise, they use a stepwise. It chose number of books in the home first, 70% of the variance. Once that was in, per pupil spending went down to about 6% because it correlated pretty highly with the number of books in the home. So they went to court to argue that school busing was necessary because family values really are, family demographics are what really determine achievement, not school. Don't bother spending more money on students in school. What you gotta do is change their demographics and the way they thought they could do that was through busing. And it was a very famous court case with statisticians arguing with each other about it. Because uh, when a famous statistician went in and said, no, it had to do, because if you went the other way, and you put per pupil spending in first, got 60% of the variance, then you put in a uh, number of books in the home, it only accounted for an additional 7%. Right? It didn't look like it was near as important. It depends which order you go in of how much they add as they go. So that's not a good way to do this. It's a famous example of how not to do this can't use stepwise to kind of post hoc theorize. And you want to be careful when you do that. Okay? A <clears throat> couple small little things. If you have a variable in your regression that's a categorical variable, <clears throat> like marital status, you can code it one married, two single, three divorced, four cohabiting, say. But think about what that would mean in terms of a, re, of a correlation. Right? Well, if you decide to use that variable in a correlation somewhere along the line in a regression, you would have the scatter plot would be whatever, whatever this dB was. One, two, three, four, five. So the scatter plot would be totally determined by whatever you call five. And if you call 1, 5, and 5, 1, it would completely change the scatter plot, right? So obviously that's not going to work. So what you have to do instead is you call dummy code them. In your, in your regression, you put in each category as a separate variable. <clears throat> so you say married, 1, 0. Single, 1, 0. Divorce, 1, 0. Cohabiting, 1, 0. So a person in that file who was um, divorced would, have a, would look like for those variables that have a zero, zero, one, zero. <clears throat> now those won't be messed up. If you put them in, you can, you can use them in a correlation. <clears throat> so you have to dummy code categorical variables. Uh, you don't want the categories to come in. I've seen many students come in saying, well, this is exciting. Ethnicity correlates really highly with something. Well, I said, yeah, well, how about changing Hispanic from a 5 to a 0, and now it correlates it negatively. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to do that. So you have to be careful in that way. Uh, we won't go into detail on it, but you can also do something called effect coding. Oh, yeah. Um, like last semester when we were doing like labeling of variables, this is different because it's a dependent variable? Because it's in a regression. Yeah, so for ANOVA, that coding is fine for ANOVA. Okay. Right? This coding is fine for ANOVA. If you wanted to compare ethnic groupings, that would just be a grouping variable. Right. So no problem. You just put it in as that and just say, uh, in your ANOVA under 
a fixed independent variable, you put that one in and it compares it. But let's say you're doing, uh, like the study we did today, adherence and um, alliance, and you wanted to also put in the equation gender of the therapist, gender of the patient, marital status. Well, if you put them in like this, it'll totally mess it up. But if you put them in with dummy coding, you could include those. That's because they have numerical value. Exactly. Exactly. So anytime you're dealing with correlations or regression, you dummy code. In the NOVA, you don't have to. Related to that is called effect coding, where you can actually do ANOVAs and multiple regression by just coding your independent variables in different codes. If you only have two, it's easy, it's just one zero. But if you have three, then you have to use these effect codes where you use one 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 for the first one, one 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 zero zero zero, zero zero one one, and then zero 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 zero. That computer will interpret that as comparing those three groups to one another even though you've only put two groups up there. So there's three groups. The first group is coded 111000. Second group is 000111. The third group is just all zeros. And when you put that in and tell it that that's how you want to compare, the computer knows that that's a comparison similar to an ANOVA. You'll get exactly the same results as an ANOVA. Now you can get to very complicated effect coding when you get to five groups or six groups, right? You have to do all these different coefficients to do it. Um, since we don't use regression to do ANOVAs very often, we're not going to worry about it too much. It's a little small section of the book on it. Just covering it briefly. Do you get it? All right, let's take a break and come back and work on interactions. <coughs> so, the topic of interaction that we had in one way ANOVA also comes up in multiple regression. And it's a pretty important topic for the kinds of stuff we do. <coughs> so we want to cover it and make sure you know how to do it. We use a, a real data example, uh, one of the uh, data sets that Connie had worked on at one point that I think is a pretty good example of it. In this example, I'm waiting for this to come back on again. Uh, we're going to, uh, what I gave you was a step-by-step -step of how to do it but the output is actually in the back of this. So in this example, the DV is PTSD symptoms um, at, at the three month mark after a trauma. The predictors are after the trauma, every, the patients in this group reported on how many, uh, a scale of intrusive thoughts after the trauma. So it's a continuous scale of how much intrusive thoughts they had about the trauma. And also a dissociation scale right after the trauma. So dissociative symptoms uh, are things like, uh, I sometimes I find myself someplace and I don't know how I got there. I often find myself daydreaming and spacing out. People are saying I'm much more spacey now. That stuff. So in this regression, we have, um, we're, gonna, we're not going to use gender in this one. We've got uh, PTSD symptoms is the DV. We've got a dissociation scale, an intrusive thought scale. And so the data is laid out. It's tricky. I can't see my computer screen. There's the data laid out in terms of the, each of the variables. And so the first thing I'm going to do is just run the regular multiple regression with two predictors and one outcome. And we'll interpret that just a good review. Multiple regression. To do that, I just analyze 
compression, linear. So let's look at that. So we can see that uh, intrusive thoughts did correlate significantly uh, with trauma symptoms, as did dissociation. Both significant, this is significance level down here, that's the actual correlation. And if you're doing this, you probably want to square those and think about those in terms of percentage of variance accounted for. Uh, it looks like the two variables correlate pretty highly with each other, right, 0.634. So there's a fair amount of overlap on those things. Okay. If we look at each one separately, we can see the same kind of information. Um, see the adjusted, it's a fairly small sample size for this one, so the adjusted R squares did drop down quite a lot. Uh, the Durbin-Watson was 1.745, not perfect, but okay. Stop me if there's anything else we need to go on these. Um, here's the ANOVA, was significant in both state, both steps, the overall ANOVA, so we know the equation is significant. Here's the equation. We could probably just go to step two in this one now. So y prime equals 22.477 plus 0.238 times intrusive thoughts plus 0.365 times dissociation. With me? So I could plug in any particular person's score into that and get a predicted value for them. Their beta weights are. Uh, 0.364 which is standard weight and you can see down here, sorry, down here is 0.144 for intrusive thoughts and 0.346 for dissociation. So when they're in together, dissociation is a little more than twice as important in the overall equation. So they, both, they both seem to contribute significantly. Uh, no, they don't. Sorry. So here we can see dissociation is significant, but now with both of them in together, even though they're, they're separately they were significant, they're, they overlap so much so that um, the uh, intrusive thoughts dropped out, they're not significant anymore. We would take dissociation and say, okay, one unit increase in dissociation would be a 0.365 increase in symptoms with intrusive thoughts held constant. Is this on our output? No. Uh, it should be. The, the final step should be, isn't it? Yeah, two is not. I didn't do it in two steps in the output. I just did it in one step. But um, <coughs> there's no model one or two. It's just model one. But the model one would be the same as our model two, right? Two, three, eight. That's it. Yeah. Right here. Three, six, five. What's the... Is, see it? Oh, the B weight's different, huh? Yeah, where's uh, that? Bro, that must have been so two different samples, two different data sets. Sorry. All right, that's fine. Hmm. 
I don't know where, where we got messed up. I must have just transferred over a different data set. But you can go by this one. That's fine. This one's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions about the general regression output? Good. Okay. So now the question comes up. Well, what about an interaction between intrusive thoughts and dissociation? For instance, if somebody was high in both, both of those, would they have more trauma symptoms than you'd expect from each of them separately? So we're thinking about synergistic effects? Yes, kind of interaction. And that's an interaction, right? So we're, two things together might give us something that's non-additive from the other two. Seems like it might happen, right? You can see lots of situations where combinations of two things. Somebody who had experienced the trauma had a lot of intrusive thoughts and had a fair highly dissociation, you might expect that person would have a lot of trauma symptoms. Uh, whereas somebody who just had one or the other might not have as many. Right? So if we want to test that, that's, that's what we might want to do. We test it with an interaction. The way we do that is we create a new variable, which is the product of the other two variables. In other words, in the equation we now have intrusive thoughts, association, we have intrusive thoughts and dissociation. Now we're going to put one in intrusive thoughts times dissociation. That's the way you end up getting an interaction in multiple regression. You keep these in, and then you put this term in as well. So we're going to do that, but there's one little trick we have to do first. It's called centering. It turns out that, it turns out not to be as important as we once thought, but because these are in different scales, they're completely different scales, there's a thought that they should be kind of put on the same scale so that they're even. And there is some reason to think that that should be true. So you, what you do is you're going to center the variables by basically subtracting every score from its mean. So the mean for both of them would be zero, and they would be deviation scores minus and positive from that. Can you repeat what you said? Yeah, you know, we're going to go ahead and take the mean of each of these scores and subtract every score in the scale from that one and get a new scale that's just the same scale, but it's just centered at zero. They're both centered at zero automatically. Some people use standard scores, but it's thought to be the centering is supposed to be better. Why would this interaction, this new like, computation we're going to do, uh, be different from like the model two you have up there or our model one? Well, think about it, because what we're going to get from this one is Imagine somebody who was quite high in, in, in intrusive thoughts and dissociation and who had a lot of high symptoms, right? Uh, that will show up because the product of the two will be really high. Yeah. We're gonna, these are the main effects, so we're going to subtract those out and say, well, what, what, what's not additive about that? So if it turned out that people who had uh, these two were high in both of these had really high trauma symptoms, it would show up like because the product would be quite high compared to everything else. Okay. So is our the output we have now? It won't pick, it won't pick that up. That's controlling for right. So that was the effect of dissociation holding constant intrusive thoughts. So it's kind of hiding maybe a better correlation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't pick it up at all. Okay. It doesn't tell us anything about people who are high in both or low in both or something. So that'll be the way we can pick that up. So unfortunately, the process is a little tricky. You've got to first go and center these, and then put this in the equation. A really important point is once this is in, it's going to mess up the main effect, so you don't interpret those anymore. They're kind of like main effects and interactions. We don't usually, once the interaction is significant, we don't really care much about the main effects. We can look at them, but we don't care. So we're going to get centered variable, centered variable. We're going to multiply centered variable times centered variable to get us an interaction. And then if we get the interaction, we have to learn how to interpret it. Wouldn't interactions give us a non-linear graph? 
Yes, if we if we can figure out how to graph. But what, what grip? No, it won't give us a nonlinear uh, scatter plot of residuals, right? Because the residuals are just the errors, and that's all we look at is the residual plots. What we are going to do, though, is we're going to dichotomize to see where the interaction is coming from. There's several ways of doing it. The easy way, though, is dichotomize these into high and low, high and low, and to do a, an interaction plot like we're used to from last semester. And then we can see where the interaction is coming from. There's a more sophisticated way that the book does it with Z scores, but actually, you can, if you actually do one of the dissertation, and, and this book is really nice. It has a detailed description of, with syntax on how to get the Z score version of it. But I think for our purposes, we won't worry about that. It's much more complicated. So. Everybody with me? Well, it's, it seems like an interaction graph wouldn't just be linear. Or a no, linear no, interaction, it's going to go up like that, right? Not the residuals, though. Remember, because the what the, would go up? Well, the interaction graph is going to be just like our ANOVA interaction graphs, right? We're going to have low, high association. One line like that, one line like that, for high, low intrusive thoughts. That's where we'll see it, then, something like that. What you're thinking about is the scatter plot. But remember, with the scatter plot of the homocysticity plot, which is residuals, and this is the predicted value, right? But that's the final. The final equation is what. What, what do we predict for that person in this final equation? And then how far off were we from what they actually got? Right. And so we wouldn't necessarily think this would be curved linear. Could be, but just because it's an interaction, it wouldn't necessarily make it curved linear. It's not picking that part of it up here. Yeah, so. Okay. So here's how you do it. I'll let you guys, I'll come around with my data, which I guess is different than this data, but it'd be close. I don't know why that intercept is something got funny with the intercept. Oh, I know why the intercept is different, because I, I centered it. That's why. So I think I can get it fixed. So here's how you do it. You can kind of go follow back through the steps now if you want to go back through the steps on the snap. <coughs> First thing I do is I transform each variable by going transform compute variable. Oh, wait, sorry. First step is to find the mean. Sorry. The first step, as you'll see on your on your first page, there is do descriptive statistics. Get my two means, one for association, one for choose the thoughts. So 43.67 is the intrusive thoughts. 43.67 is the intrusive thoughts. And 40, 41.13, 43.67 is the association, sorry. Forty-one point six seven, forty-one point no, point one three. It's the intrusive thoughts. Okay, so I got those. Now I go to transform compute and make up a name for the new variable. I'm going to call it centered. C E N T intrusive. I can't see my keyboard there sometimes. And that's going to be basically intrusive thoughts 41.13. So I can look at here and say 41. Uh, 
Now that creates a centered variable called that one. Now I've got to do that again. Transform compute. I'm going to call this one centered association. That's going to be 43.67 minus okay. Now we need an interaction term, so we do transform compute. And we call this one, what do they call it? Centered, centered interaction. This variable times this variable. So now those variables are now in my data set. There they are. Now I'm ready to run my interaction. So I'm analyze, regression, and here. I keep that as a DV. We don't need to do this hierarchically. We can just do it once. So we're going to put in centered intrusive, centered dissociation, and centered interaction. Can we do that all in the same block? Yeah, you, you can. You don't have to, but usually you would just, because we're all we're really trying to get to with this one. Right. And the option should be, the, uh, the statistics should be the same. Everything stays the same. Now I think the output you have will be right there. So we have our correlations between them. Now everything changes when, not in correlation, as you'll see in the regression changes. So overall, we've kind of for 33% of the variance, which is pretty good. Uh, quite significant. And we don't care about the main effect so much. We're looking here to see whether we get a significant interaction, and sure enough, we do. The B is negative, so it's a little bit hard to interpret that just by itself. So we, we need a little bit of help in interpreting that, because what does that really mean? A one unit change in the centered interaction, which is the product of the two scores, means a decrease in slight decrease in trauma symptoms. And that's a little bit hard to make any sense of. Right? So what we want to do is kind of get an interaction graph out of this so we can really see where that interaction is coming from. With me so far? Have you been doing any of this yet? Okay. I didn't get any nods, but I didn't get any questions either. Um, where am I? Are those results the same as you've got in your output? Yeah. This one? I think that's the same. The reason that y intercept changed from your from the first output is because I didn't use the centered variable, so that changes the starting point of the graph. Everything else is the same. This is the same. Yep, that works. Okay, so usually you can't really tell much from just this output. So what we want to do is get it into a PC. So to do that, we have to go through some rigmarole to do it. Here's the steps to do that. First thing we do is turn our predictors into uh, dichotomized variables, high and low. So we don't use we don't need to use the centered variables to do it. So what I'm going to do is transform, recode into different variables. This is a really good uh, function to learn how to use. There's a lot of times you need to do this. So why we're are doing, you doing this? Yeah, to graph. What we're going to do is we're going to we're going to turn it into an ANOVA type set of ways so we can look at the graph. Oh. So we're going to turn uh, intrusive thoughts into high 
group of high intrusive thoughts, a group of low, and we're going to turn dissociation a group of high and low. Then we can do the ANOVA graph on it and look and see where the interaction is coming from. The fancier way to do it is to do it, you set it up for different Z scores of, uh, of the DV, and then you get the graph for different Z scores. Like you do a plus one standard deviation of zero and a minus one. But you get the same basic graph. That you get. So we'll be able to tell this one. Oh, Transform recoded to different variables. See that? Is that part of your step by step process? Yeah. Right here? Okay. My, my, I think it is. I might have got the wrong one in there, but it's like we got it. Okay. See it? Okay. Okay, so the variable <coughs> I'm going to recode first is uh, intrusive thoughts. So I put that over into, this, into the code here. I've got to give it a na new name. So I'm going to call it intrusive thoughts high low is what I like to call it. Call it one. Then you click on all the new values. And here it gives you a chance to change the value. What we're going to do is going to say all the values from the lowest value through the mean. Intrusive thoughts, the mean is 41.13. We're going to call those zeros. And all the values from 41.14 to the highest value, we're going to call those ones. Oh, not there, sorry. Uh, sorry. Okay, now we've told it to kind of recode that variable into ones and zeros, with the ones being the high people and the zeros being the low people. Just say continue and change, okay, and it's done. Now again, we have a new variable in here. Let's people code it into their highs and lows on intrusive thoughts. Now we're going to do the same thing for association. Recode into different variables. Start with association. Call it T I S S C I low. Hold the new values. Lowest through 43.67. Okay, we're going to call that one a zero. Low ones, high, low, 
And all we really want out of this is the graph. So we want one of these in horizontal, one of these on separate lines, and continue. So we're going to see if we can do that. <laughs> so if you're looking at the graph, you can see exactly where that interaction came from. It's as we suspected. This is real data, too. It's kind of a nice finding. So those people who, after the trauma, had, were high on dissociation, especially. First of all, if they're high on dissociation, they were going to be much worse off, period, right? So here the main effect actually sort of does make some, make some sense. So the dissociation line has higher symptoms all the way across. But if they had a combination of that, of, and for the low dissociatives, it didn't really seem to matter if they had intrusive thoughts or not, right? But for those folks that had both high intrusive thoughts and high dissociation, they had very high symptom scores. Is there any way you could email us these slides? Uh, sure. Just I know, way. like, when going through the process and stuff, it's kind of hard to see a little bit, but you can't really tell exactly, you can't read it very well. Yeah, it's just if I, if I make it bigger, it uses so much paper out. Yeah. Yeah, I can, if you just, I can always, any slide you want, I can always email them to you. Okay. Just let me know. I can do that. Okay. So, your task is to do this. <laughs> see if you can get it right, unlike me. Now the data, I've got the data on a stick, so let's start just duplicating. Who else has got sticks with them? Anybody else? Okay. Got a stick with them? So let's start taking the sticks and sticking them on the computer so you can do the data. So get logged in and I'll come around and do that. Okay. Uh, 